All right, good afternoon, guys. Uh, very happy to be here in front of you. Today is Tuesday, February 2nd, Groundhog's Day. And I don't, does anyone know if the uh, if the groundhog saw his shadow or not, if we're gonna have an extended winter or not? I didn't know um, if there's an official groundhog out there, but uh, what I wanted to share is a couple of updates really quickly regarding what's going on in our industry, because it's important to keep a pulse on what's going on uh, the marketplace. But what we have right now, I wanted to talk about because it's very important to understand what's going on with what's called SB 91. The Senate has put together a bill that really impacts housing. It's a relief type of bill for landlords and for tenants. So this is breaking news. And uh, you guys see my screen right now, correct? Yes or no? I hope you guys did. Yes. And yes, yes. so I wanted, thank you. I wanted to share SB 91 and talk about this because I think so many of our clients, people who we put into uh, tenancies and or landlords who are struggling and having so many questions for you and you, we're like, I don't know. Uh, here we have, now we know. SB 91 is gonna be the solution for Americans and regarding statewide uh, 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 rentals, California is putting together Senate Bill 91, which is going to provide financial assistance to qualifying household providers like landlords and to tenants. And they're setting aside a ton of money to help pay for what's called unpaid rent. Okay. Many of us, I don't know how many horror stories you have with your clients and, and people that saying, oh, my tenant has not paid me since March, or I have six months of unpaid rent. What do I do? How do I kick them out? And you know, what are my solutions? It's important to be able to know that there are solutions now that we have uh, this SB 91, because we're kind of anticipating this for the past couple of months. We were saying, you know, I think there's gonna be a bill. I think there's gonna be a proposal or some sort of relief. And this is what it's gonna be. So let's talk about it. It is a couple of things to understand because yes, the eviction moratorium and the foreclosure moratorium is from the federal down has been uh, you know, in place since you know, September, 2020 and they extended the uh, uh, protections for tenants and for people who are behind on their mortgage uh, through March of 2021, and they are likely going to continue and extend it again in March because we are still having people only only tier one A and B, which is the frontline healthcare workers and only the seniors over 65 years old are able to get vaccinated. So businesses are still suffering. There's still a lot of closures and still in the purple tier where it's still one of the highest restrictions on businesses and reopenings of various types of businesses. So there's lots of people still unable to do their business. Uh, we just recently have uh, outdoor dining re-allowed in uh, Los Angeles County. So some restaurants are able to, uh, to do some business, but we still have tons of people uh, like, like schools. Uh, that are not operating at full capacity or they're talking about uh, education and, and trying to bring uh, kids back into school. They're trying to talk about, you know, like, like gyms and, and different types of uh, workplaces where they have a lot of people in there. Uh, we don't know when we're going to get out of the purple tier. We need to see drastic, drastic uh, declines in COVID cases. But it's important to understand what is this going to allow? Oh. 
Sorry, guys, I had a, a, a staticky reported voice. Uh, hopefully you guys can hear me now. I just changed to my different connection. I hope you guys can hear me now. So SB91 is going to be the solution where up to 80% of the unpaid rent, the tenants or the landlord can apply for uh, relief, okay? And so this, it's important to understand and share this news. And I'm going to get to the uh, information updates because I just attended some sessions from CAR and from Gov Hutchinson, who explains this in detail that I hope you guys uh, were able to attend those sessions because I it was very informative. So what this is going to allow, um, $25 billion is gonna to go to direct financial relief to rental property owners, landlords, and to the tenants, okay? So what this is gonna allow, and one of the caveats to this is that it's gonna extend the statewide eviction moratorium law until currently June 30th, 2021. People, tenants who are Sorry, I'm having technical difficulty. I don't know why it's doing that. What this is gonna allow is the uh, eviction moratorium. It's a caveat because they know that it's gonna be extended to June 30th, 2021, where landlords who are trying to evict their tenant or try to get someone who's gonna pay them rent. Uh, what this is gonna allow is an extension of the eviction moratorium but ultimately it's gonna give a solution to those landlords because California and Congress, they, uh, the, our Senate, they, they want to keep people in place. They don't want a lot of uh, increased, un, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know why, my, I keep on getting cut off. They wanna keep, people off the streets. They don't want homelessness to go crazier than it is already right now. And Senate Bill 90, uh, that's going to uh, definitely just uh, help with a Band-Aid for all of the unpaid rent. It's going to address that solution. So either the tenant or the landlord can apply for this relief. Okay. And for the landlord's perspective, what they're going to be able to do is say, I have and show evidence that I have eight months of unpaid rent. They apply for uh, with, you know, the rent roll and or the contract, and they're going to provide some certain amount of evidence. And the government will issue a payment to the landlord for 80% of that balance due to bring that tenant current. What it won't allow the landlord to do is to pursue for the remaining 20%. So if you are a landlord and you think you're never going to get any money from this tenant, they lost their job, they're unemployed, they're, you know, keep on continuing to, to burden you and you can't kick them out, at least there's a solution to get 80% of that amount as until the funds are exhausted. So you would ask or tell your property managers and landlords to get on this ASAP, but they can't pursue the remaining 20%. That's, that's going to be a condition that the government's going to require if you are going to uh, ask for this uh, relief. The details on this are still working it out but I wanted to share my screen on a little bit more about SB 91 and talk about it. So the, we don't know if June 30th is the exact date when the moratorium will be lifted. It's possible and maybe even very likely they will extend it again. It's been extended you know, three times already. It was supposed to be last uh, September 1st and then they extended it throughout the, uh, the end of the year. To, uh, now it's all the way to June 30th. So it looks like we're going to be in this pandemic and protections for quite some time. Uh, and we don't know when it's going to end. So let's talk about SB 91. I'm going to pull up a little bit article about what's going on with this. And I kind of wanted to 
share with you more of the uh, requirements about this because the tenants can also apply as well. If they need, uh, if they had someone in their family that kind of maybe was impacted by COVID, they lost their job, <clears throat> they can apply for this and they still have to pay 25% of their monthly rent in order to be eligible for the relief. Okay, from the tenant perspective, they must still uh, respond to standard notices to pay and send in that minimum 25% to the landlord. And ultimately, there are protections in case, uh, depending upon whether the landlord wants to evict them for other reasons. Now, there are some ways the landlord can evict the tenant. They're not gonna do it for unpaid rent, but they would have to do it for other reasons, such as removing a unit from the housing market. Maybe it's a landlord that wants to move in or they have a direct sibling or relative that might filling in that rental. Uh, they, there's a possibility for that. And it becomes down to just cause and no fault evictions, okay? So it's important to really just understand there's a difference and there's relief and there's requirements and duties by a landlord if they evict just cause or no fault. So I wanna explain that really quickly because it's important to decipher between the two. The, and I, I just heard a, uh, a couple of cases where landlords had failed to provide the rent, statewide rent control, Form. So I'm going to show this to you really quickly and explain to you what it means. Um, here is a little write up because our car forms already have this form called RCJC. And an agent asked me last week, hey, uh, we want to evict this tenant. We're going to be putting this on the market and we want the tenant, the space to be vacant. Uh, what should we do? And then the landlord wants to evict them right now give them 60 days notice and we'll put it in the market 60 days. And I just told them, well, first of all, is your landlord an entity like an LLC or are they individual? Because it depends. And then the agent tells me yeah, they're, they're individuals. And I said, oh, okay. Well, yeah, they should be exempt from statewide rent control. You're not in a jurisdiction. Your city is not a uh, overly protected city like Los Angeles. So there's no rental ordinances in place except for the statewide rent control. And so they should automatically be exempt. Yes, they can give them a 60 day notice if they, as long as they didn't give the a pandemic excuse for non-payment of rent and you could evict them or ask them to vacate because their term is up and their, the contract is up. But my question became, did your owner give them notice of the rent cap and just cause addendum? And the agent told me no. And I said, then it could be determined that the tenant has now protections in place. And the tenant has uh, the statewide rent control in their favor if they brought this in front of a judge, jury, or dispute resolution, or some sort of uh, landlord tenant attorney on that form. So I wanted to bring up that form just so you can see what it could was, was. And this is the form that you guys should be able to see automatically attached to every lease that was started a year ago or a year and a half ago. This is automatically attached. However, this was not pre-attached or automatically included in any tenancies that started in 2019 or before. So if you had an existing tenant who's been there for longer than a year, you were supposed to give them this form, which I reminded you so many times. And I told them that this form is for everyone who you already put into a tenant in place, send them this form and let them know what is your classification, whether you are exempt or not exempt. So what does it mean? Basically first, I'm gonna show you what that form looks like. And this is a two page form. 
and you were supposed to check this box in your rental agreements and say, landlord hereby notifies tenant the property is exempt from rental cap provisions based on the just cause evictions. Uh, this is to be exempt. You have to be a single family house, like any single family dwelling in the state of California. And it had to be a situation where the owner is an individual, they're not an LLC or an, ent an enterprise type of uh, housing accommodation. And they, if it's a dwelling, like a two unit or an ADU or any type of like some situation where there's two plus occupancies with different rentals, um, ADUs were exempted as well, okay? But if it was a duplex, that's considered to be, it applies, okay? So what I was wanted to show to you is this form and the importance of this, because in this situation, the agent, I told the, land, I told the agent, I don't want you to be advising the landlord on the eviction or the ability to ask them to vacate. I'd rather the attorney get their own property manager attorney involved because in, there are certain, there are gonna be repercussions if this tenant challenges your notice to vacate. So anyway, here's what, the, here's what it means. The rent cap is basically simple to understand. Effective immediately in 2019, the Tenant Protection Act of 2019 says, whatever your rent was for March or February of 2019, the landlord can only increase the rent 5% plus the cost of living for that area. Okay, in LA County, I think it was roughly 2.8%. So you can only raise it 7.8% than the tenancies uh, rent the year prior. Okay, that's a maximum rent increase reg uh, regardless of where the city is, unless there's a more strict their ordinance in place. And that would be include cities like LA County uh, LA City, who has more stringent than the statewide cap. So the more stringent policy will apply. Okay. And that's a simple formula that uh, you just can't gouge a rent and they're normally paying 1000 per month. And all of a sudden you go here, I want you to pay 2000 per month. A landlord won't be able to do that because of this rent cap if they're ineligible. But if it was a house, yes, the landlord could do that. They could just increase and double the rent, but they had to be disqualified. They had to declare that they're not subject to the statewide rent control. Most of the questions I received as a broker is regarding the just cause, okay? Everyone understands the rent cap. That's, that's kind of understandable and easy. You can just calculate and find out what the air, uh, the maximum for LA County or for San Bernardino County or with this and that, you can find out what the maximum rent if you were required to follow this procedure. But the at fault and no fault is one of the clarifications that I think you need to be understanding on. At fault means the tenant has some sort of harm, injury, or breach of contract where then they are not eligible for certain protections. These are the specific reasons where a tenant would be at fault. They would be defaulting in their payment of rent, like they're behind, you know, didn't pay any payments for the past eight months. Okay, that's a default in their payment. They could breach the contract, and that could be such things as they added three or four different co-residents, maybe family members, people that were not specifically added to the contract. And now you have, you know, instead of four people in a family in there, now you have four people plus the parents-in-law or uh, another family that moved in. And that's a material term of a breach. Perhaps they're getting all these nuisances or re, uh, complaints. And maybe they have trash that's being stored on the property or the city issued them violations or they committed some sort of a, a, a waste like right here committing waste, maybe they're dumping oil onto the ground 
or they, they use the property as a business and it's supposed to be only for housing. Maybe they're growing marijuana and or uh, methamphetamines or and stuff like that. That's obviously a breach of the contract where they did not get landlord permission. So maybe they fail to execute a lease renewal. That's one of the easiest ways that a landlord can try to get them out is because they did not sign your written contract renewal and they refuse to sign another year. Maybe they're doing criminal activity. Like I told you, they're using a business or they, I had situations where um, there was a business in which the landlord was renting out and running in operations. The tenant was running in operations of a baby birthing factory. And they would by partition the bedrooms and have eight or nine pregnant moms living in the same household. And they were taking money and giving them nursing uh, birthing type of uh, uh, services inside that household. I've had situations of marijuana and that criminal activity. And you have situations of other businesses or other types of uh, consultations. Maybe they're holding psychology, psychiatric sessions there. Maybe they're using the house as a daycare center for keeping babies, um, you know, just, just having and watching some, 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 some uh, children. So those are all things and activities that could be considered not subject to the lease if they did not specify it. And or they assign or sublet the premises to somebody else. So there are situations where a normal person just rented out the property and then guess what? They started to sublet the property because it had a great location or it was a convenient area. And they started airbnb it to short-term rentals every, yeah. few days, every four days. They're renting the property out to do another person out and making this a business as well. So Airbnb could be a type of uh, short-term rental sublet. Now, uh, if the tenant refuses to allow the owner to enter when you give them proper 24-hour notice, that's also a at fault for the tenant who breached the contract. And another situation would be when they have unlawful purposes of using the property. Maybe like I've had situations where tenants run a mechanics and repair shop in their household and they just have people coming over, they're working on cars and they're changing out tires and they're doing all this stuff as a business. Another situation is when they fail to deliver possession back to the owner um, or they forget to fail to surrender the property back to the owner and they still leave behind a lot of furniture and debris and this and this and that, uh, they don't give it back in time. So these are all reasons to be at fault. Owner, what are the repercussions and uh, abilities of the owner? They could terminate that tenancy for at fault. It is curable, meaning the owner can ask and require them notice to cure or quit and ask for X amount of payment or, or this and this and that to correct the breach of contract. And if they fail to cure it, then the landlord can give them and serve them notices in a normal situation, not during a pandemic. Kevin, yeah, um, for serve, serve, serve the notice is 60 day notice or 30 days? It depends on how long the tenant's been there. If they've been there longer than one year, 60 days. I see. Okay, thank you. And the one that people don't understand too much is there, there is some no fault just cause reasons to evict. So like I told you, if I have an immediate family member, my spouse, my, uh, my partner, my children, my grandchildren, parents or guardian, or grandparents, specifically, not a cousin, these people, I can allow them and occupy and vacate that rental unit for my immediate family to use. And this is for specifically any leases that are uh, committed or signed after January 1st, 2020. So I have the right as a landlord to terminate this lease, ask them to, to vacate after the 60 day notice after they live there so that my sister can move in. Now, 
I could withdraw the premises from the rental market. So maybe I'm going to take it out of the market as a rental, ask my tenant to leave, and I'm going to do something like uh, substantially remodel the property. That's number D. I might demolish. I might build an ADU. I might remodel the entire interior and make it luxury grade. So anything that requires a permit is considered to be substantially remodeled, like electrical, plumbing, mechanical systems. Maybe you're going to do a new roof or you're going to need do some substantial things that require a permit. Uh, cosmetic improvements like flooring and paint, that's not substantial enough, okay? And if uh, maybe the property just has a terrible roof or maybe the heater is broken or the plumbing is not working and you need to redo the entire plumbing system, that's not considered unsafe, that's considered unsafe habitation. So if you have a situation where you need to vacate the unit and do substantial remodeling or improvements, those are no fault of the tenant. They didn't uh, cause this and therefore they would be entitled to tenant payments if it was that type of situation, A, B, C, or D. The tenant would give them the notice. They would have to give them relocation assistance, which is only one month's rent to, to give them opportunity to find another property to lease out, give them one month back of, of uh, compensation and in lieu of the direct payment, the owner may waive the payment of last month's rent. So that way they can relocate, find another housing, and they would be getting that as a benefit for no fault. So that is something that you have to understand that that's going to be a duty of the landlord if this statewide rent control applies to them. Now, many owners say, yeah, I, but I'm only leasing out my single family home. This I've been leasing out to the same people for 20 years or 10 years. Uh, this and this and that, you know, they're, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm exempt. You are exempt if you gave them this form. If you did not give them this form, the law says you're then becoming subject to statewide rent control. And that's why I told you guys so many times in 2019, make sure you do it by the extended deadline of August last uh, 2020. So that was that. That's considered uh, what are considered exempt. All single families are exempt, but they must provide this form. That's all. That, any duplex, triplex, quadplex, five plus units, multifamily, those are automatically applies. So anyone who's an apartment building owner, anybody who has a triplex, as long as you are not living in one of those duplexes, like, like here, there's a specific exemption for a duplex. If you live in one unit and then you uh, rent out your, your ADU or your duplex, then you could be exempt as long as you gave them this form, okay? The other exemption is if I live in one house, one roof, and I rent out per room, and I have a five bedrooms, I live in one bedroom, and I rent out my other three bedrooms, then this is also exempt because I get to, I don't have to follow these guidelines because I'm under the same roof. Every other single property in California, this will apply to if you didn't give them this notice. That's a sucky part about being a landlord if you didn't manage your property correctly. That's why I tell agents, I don't want you guys to be doing property management because I don't know if all of you guys are following the statewide law. Does that make sense guys? Any questions? Because I know I, there must be a lot of questions you guys have. So to be exempt, um, if you held the property in a REIT, which is a, tr a real estate investment trust, or a corporation, or if you held it in an LLC where at least one member is a corporation, then you are automatically not exempt. You, you do have to follow all of these rent cap, cap and just cause eviction requirements and duties. Now, the only other way is if you strike a mutual agreement, which is what I advised my tenant, my, my agent. Now, obviously, yes, they're entitled to all of these benefits or they're entitled to this and that. But if the tenant and the landlord come to a mutual agreement that is anything different than this, then that's fine too. So that's the compromise your landlord and your tenants 
should try to reach if they don't want to follow these guidelines, then maybe the landlord and tenant have a good working relationship. And the landlord says, I'm, you know, I hope you move out. I need to use this for my sister to move in next month, but we'll be very flexible. If you need 60 days, let me give me 60 days. If you need 90 days, I'll give you 90 days. But, um, but you know, they can strike a written agreement and they can make accommodations to support each other. And that could be done. So I, I don't mind them making their own mutual agreements as long as it's you know signed in written form. Kevin, so any questions you have? Yes, Kevin, um, I'm looking the uh, duplex uh, or two unit for my client in LA, but I overheard that um, they say if like under one roof, okay, like earlier you say like four, four bedroom, right? If mm -hmm. the existing tenant over there and when my client buy the property, the existing ten, uh, tenant over there, and when they live in, they cannot correct any rent from, for, from them, right? Is it true? Um, let, me, let me clarify. They purchased a duplex. Yeah. This duplex has one roof or different detached buildings? Have one roof. So it's an attached duplex. Yeah. Owner is living in one of those units and a tenant that was living, the tenant was in place when they purchased the property as the same tenant. Uh-huh, yes. So they have a rental contract and they should be collecting monthly rent from that tenant. Correct? Can they correct, can, can they correct it? Can, can they correct the, the rent from the previous tenant? But they have a separate... I don't know what uh, you mean by previous tenant. You, the, the, it, you told me that there was an existing tenant. Like uh, my buyer purchased this, this uh, duplex, right? Yeah. They want to make an offer on this duplex, but the existing owner lived with the, the previous owner lived with the, the tenant under one roof, but they have uh, different different entrance to the property. One is on the second floor, one is on the first floor, right? But yeah. under same roof. So if my client, the new buyer coming in and they cannot correct any rent from that that own uh, that previous tenant. Is but the true? previous tenant is still the same tenant, isn't it? So it's it's not the previous tenant, it's the existing tenant. Yeah, existing tenant, yes. So don't say previous because previous means they moved out. This is the same oh, tenant. No. Yeah, same tenants. Yeah. So my answer to you is when you close escrow, the sale of that escrow brings all rent current. So anything that was prior to your close of escrow date is debt from the previous seller with their own collection to that tenancy who has unpaid rent. But assuming that, let's say you closed on January 31st of 2021, like a couple of days ago, mm -hmm. then I'm current. I'm the new owner. So I'm only going to collect from February, March, and April and on. Mm -hmm. That's that's my, uh, if I'm the buyer and I purchased it and I closed on January 31st, I am now the entitled owner from February 1st on. So I would only address what my ownership is, any, uh, any loss or passive rent from the past should be done from the previous seller. Mm -hmm. I'm current. So there's no unpaid rent because I'm current. I see. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't understand know. what you mean. Yeah, now, if, I, the if the tenant fails to pay February, March, and April, then I can collect for those months. Mm-hmm. And so, the only other situation that I can specifically tell you is if your sale purchase had terms in there where the previous seller gave the rights to the new buyer to collect after unpaid rents. And you have mm -hmm. to have that specific language and you're going to pursue that in court. I see. So okay. I don't see any agents giving that language in contracts to pursue for unpaid rent. Mm -hmm. Some landlords could try to strike that or say, hey, you have, I'll give you the rights to $20,000 of unpaid rent I have. 
but give me $20,000 more on my purchase price. Or maybe they just ask for 10,000 extra more mm-hmm. and say, here, just give me 10,000. I'll cut my losses. You have the rights to collect for those months year prior. If you have a specific language in your contracts that say that, maybe you can pursue that. But that's, that's at the risk of the buyer pursuing and prevailing in court and to cover my legal fees. And, you know, there's a big chance. So I wouldn't pay, you know, 50, I would, I would pay less than 50 cents to the dollar on that for those rights. I see. And also I another question. Not even having to be having responsible for the unpaid rents. I'd rather mm-hmm. just, let's say, I'm purchasing the price from, from February, you know, for the rights for February 1st onward. I don't want, you know, you, you take care of what you, what the tenant owes you. I'll worry about my tenant and I'll worry about February and on. And if he doesn't pay me for the next three months, I'll evict them in June when the, the moratorium is lifted. Mm-hmm. Does that answer yeah. your question? Yeah. Uh-huh. But I have another question is I just pull out the car form from, from, from online and they already update the car form for a rent cap and, and just case addendum in December 20. Yep. And, and, and this, uh, 19, is it? Oh, that's the, the older one. That's the older one. You're right. There is, there is a revised one. Yeah. So, so is it the revised one? We, 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 all the term and, and, and everything will be, will be uh, applied to the new one and then the old one will be no more, right? Well, whether you provided the old form or the new form, as long as you provided this form and you can label yourself as exempt, I, I don't think the, 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 the year or the form matters. If you gave this form, it had the proper civil code language. They just revised and added you know, red sections here and there, but they, they improved it. But as long as you gave it to them, you are going to be in good shape as a landlord. Yeah, yeah. If we we use the two thousand uh, December twenty, all the term and and regulation or wording will be applied on the twenty. Will be no more anything applied on the nineteen, right? Yeah, then you're not going to be able to even access the twenty nineteen form anymore. You, I mean, you're going to just yeah, yeah. only they, they 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 update twice a year, every mm-hmm. April and every December. There's uh-huh. revisions where CAR is going to make revisions. Like next week, I'm going to the CAR director meetings. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't sit on standards forms committee, but they do have meetings where they're going to discuss what are the April changes for 2021. And you'll see those changes coming soon. I sit on different committees, but yes, we're meeting all the directors uh, from CAR. We're meeting next week. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, 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 sorry. Earlier, I, I, I was on. I was busy. I didn't, uh, I listen to it. So right, right now, I have one, um, one listing in Tamakula. If can we evict the tenant, uh, because or no, not evict, like serve sixty days to the tenant because we're selling the house. Uh, that's a good question. So I don't think Temecula has any specific um, uh, ordinance, but like what I was telling you regarding the RCJC for Los Angeles and your previous client, you're not mm-hmm. going to use this, the statewide rent control because Los Angeles has a more restrictive code for evicting a tenant. So that's going to apply regardless of what I just told you right now for mm-hmm. Los Angeles City. If it's Los Angeles County, then it's a statewide uh, policy. Mm-hmm. Now for Temecula, you asked me, does that tenant, the landlord have any rights to vacate the tenant right now under 60 days? It's not an eviction. And it's, and this would be considered to be, my, my first question would be, did your landlord give, when they signed up this tenant, have they given them an RCJC form? Yes or no? No, that's, that, that's a long time ago. Yeah. That is back to- so they, they executed this three, five, six years ago. They're running whatever contract they're running. Now, their failure to provide this form by the deadline means statewide rent control applies to Temecula's rent housing, even if it's single family, even if they're individuals. 
So now you, you fall under the umbrella that the 60 day notice to vacate and they are current in their rents and they are paying and they're not breaching. They're all fully in compliance. That landlord can ask them to vacate and empty the unit, but uh, it depends on the tenants, what's called cooperation or resistance. Mm -hmm. okay. Now in that specific situation, because the statewide rent control applies, this is not an eviction. This is more of a notice to vacate, to, mm -hmm. to, to remove the property off the market. So then I would say, because of their failure to provide that form, they would be entitled, yes, to give them 60 days notice to vacate and the landlord should give them one month's rent as mm -hmm. a compensation. I see. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah. Uh -huh. So I'm just going to show to you what that looks like because the re most revised form, whenever you put in a lease, that is uh, this form like start like 2019, like the earlier, right? If we started, for the started 2019. When I, yeah, yeah, when I emailed everyone, read the Tenant Protection Act of 2019. Very important. Mm -hmm. Make sure you send the RCJC forms to your, to, your, to your existing tenants. And when you sign a new lease, it's automatically attached. So, so if, if still month to month, so because we don't want to renew, is go by month to month. Do we still need to 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 send them this form? Yeah, because month to month is a still a tenancy. Mm -hmm. And oh. it doesn't matter if you're month to month. It's for all tenants to know and acknowledge this form. So when you have this form, this is the revised version of 2020. Like you said, you would check yeah. this box because it's exempt of a single family house and boom, a single family, I'm an individual. Okay, I'm, I'm exempt by just checking this box. And then it's supposed to give a disclosure to the tenant and then they just sign it and then boom, I'm, I would be uh, fined as a landlord. And like I said, always seek legal counsel or a qualified real estate lawyer or wherever who is familiar with where the city is located prior to serving any notice. That's why I tell all agents, don't get involved in sending these notices or preparing them for your clients because I don't know if you did your due diligence for that city. So I ask them to go through an eviction attorney or to go through some sort of uh, uh, qualified property manager who knows that specific city. Mm -hmm. Okay. When I talk about liability and where are the most cases, it's in rentals uh, is more than in purchase purchases of housing. That's where most lawsuits are happening right now. It's in, it's in tenancies and disputes between landlord and tenant, improper notice, improper, uh, uh, you know, uh, renting out illegal areas, you know, stuff like that. Okay. Yes. So your landlord who failed to provide that notice is now it, this technically applies now like i said you can always come to a mutual agreement so that's why i said you know if the tenant's willing to vacate but they're willing to maybe they don't know their rights and that's fine and it's okay to be ignorant uh, if they don't know the rights and they say okay we'll leave in 60 days great draft an agreement up that they're willing to vacate and uh you know you're gonna you know, help them out or maybe you don't even have to help them out. You can go ahead and, and, and acknowledge a notice to vacate and see if they challenge it. But many tenants will start who want to stay because a lot of tenants don't wanna be displaced. They will get mm -hmm. advice. They're gonna to talk to a tenant uh, friendly attorney. They're gonna provide the contract and the details and the dates of your notices. And then that, that legal attorney is gonna protect them and create a, a case against the landlord. Okay, so that mm -hmm. they can buy more time. Mm -hmm. And then if they fail to comply or fail to agree to your thing, then they're going to, then you're not even going to be able to evict them until June. June. Oh. So far. We don't right know if it's now, it's been, 
It's not extend until March only. June. June. Oh, yeah. Last time I I heard is. Yeah, it was March. March. It was March, but now mm -hmm. I just I, at the beginning of my class I talked about there's SB ninety one now, and statewide is initiated uh, till it was March, and now it's going to be June. In, in oh. June. <laughs> It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Now let's yeah. take a look at what this grant. Uh, let's take a look at this guide for the relief, because I want you guys to go ahead and, and advise your clients to check out the the program, and sending them notices about getting the relief. Here is the overview of what happens. People will apply, whether it's a tenant, whether it's the landlord. They're gonna gather your contract, your lease agreement, any rent rolls, unpaid rent. They're gonna score how much your priority is because it's for eligible people. And they're gonna prioritize those certain areas. And they're gonna prioritize under, I guess, uh, lower, more vulnerable cities. So, for example, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to say like Inland Empire, or they're going to Riverside County. They're going to prioritize uh, housing areas that have the most need, and then areas like San Marino and maybe Arcadia are considered to be higher tier. So, those landlords are going to get less benefit than the other landlords because because of the need of the area. Now, round one is they're going to review it. They're going to approve certain people and validate it get a W-9 because now they're gonna get income. The landlord will receive 80% income for the unpaid rent and they're gonna distribute the awards, okay? Then there's gonna be a priority wait list based on the area and you know whether they're gonna prioritize individuals and families first before they prioritize corporations or larger landlords that have multiple units. Those are going to be in the wait list and they maybe they'll go to round two. And then there's going to be people who are going to be denied any benefits because they do not meet the minimum eligibility requirements. So they're not going to be even eligible at all. It could be like an LLC owner. It could be someone who has 30, 50 units. And these people are not going to get those benefits because they're not individual or smaller owners. They're going to favor those who are small property time owners. And then round two happens and they're gonna start this process all over again and approve the next wait list and the next round of applications. This will keep on going until funds are exhausted, that X amount of billion dollars that's being dedicated. So just to give you an overview really quickly, there's two rounds of distribution right now that's planned. Round one is 237 million, round two another 237 million it's not based on first come first serve. Each round is gonna be eligible for, uh, it, basically they're looking for the most vulnerable and disadvantaged people, okay? And this is for the business side of things. Let me show you where the tenant side The they're gonna they're gonna they are gonna when the the governor Hutchinson meeting that I went to said they're gonna prioritize certain areas and I don't know whether they're gonna give tenancy or equal weight to the tenants or the landlords I don't know exactly the formula of how they're gonna do it but you want to send in your applications as soon as possible when this is uh, effective so that they can start applying for that relief the situation on the procedure let me let me try to find that for you.
we're going to get updates from CAR and obviously when you check back and we're going to send those over to our landlords so that they can review it, but don't advise them what, what applies or doesn't apply. Okay, so of this money, 1.5 billion, they're going to contact and, and share this out. Uh, it is signed by the governor Newsom already. And I just don't know when they're going to roll it out to do the applications. That's something I need to find out. Um, Let's go ahead and, and, and discuss the next section I wanted to talk about, which is regarding acting against the advice of broker. So I had many situations where tenants don't follow our advice. There's situations where I would sell a property to a client and they don't want to, uh, re, re, you know, they, they, they're willing to take some risks, okay? so. For example, what's one of the things that we always tell a client to do? We advise them to do an inspection, uh, do a general home inspection. And sometimes that general home inspection will call out, bring in a contractor for the roof or bring out someone for the uh, plumbing or check with the mold uh, company to, to sample this bathroom where there's black visible substance there to take a mold sample. Maybe they have a, a situation where the plumbing is old and they do fail to get a, to scope the sewer and, or, you know, this and that plumbing. So sometimes I can't force a buyer to pay for all these inspections. I can't, but I can only give them the advice that they should. And if they don't, that's fine. I want to document my situation, my, 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 my records that I gave them the advice to, to get something because we don't know what lies beneath the walls or the foundation. We don't like, you know what lies in the sewer, if there's tree rots, tree branches breaking the sewer line lateral, or I don't know if the roof has a visible or a evidence of ongoing leak and needs maintain, maintenance, all that stuff. So I use this form acting against the advice of the broker all the time when they don't follow my advice. So uh, sometimes I can see that a property doesn't have permits. And so I say, buyer, I advise you to check with the city, see and pull the records on the permits and or they, maybe they have uh, uh, plans to demolish and remodel or add square footage or to build an ADU. Then I would tell them to check with the city to see what are they will allow. What are, what are the uh, maximum square footage? Will this be approved for an ADU? Does it meet the minimum guidelines? Is there a record or a permit for this extra bedroom and bath? I have a discrepancy in my, my property profile record, which is county records. I have a discrepancy between what's on the record and what I see physically when the appraiser measured the property. So whenever you have a, a, a square footage dispute or you have a bedroom or bathroom discrepancy or a lot size, maybe the lot line is the fence or the, uh, not all fences are built exactly on the lot line. So in those situations, I advise them to check with the city or to hire a surveyor or to hire an, uh, an appraiser or a type of person. And if they fail to do that, great, I'm okay with it. Just get this acknowledgement signed on the acting against the advice of the broker. So you need to document everything, not just verbally say, I advise you to get a plumber in or a mold guy in. And he's gonna say, no, I don't want to, it's expensive. And then boom, okay, you said no, everything's good. The problem happens when there's a complaint and the buyer moves in next month when they closed and then their children gets a respiratory disease or asthma or, or because there's mold in the property. And your verbal conversation with your client is not documented. They're going to tell their attorney, no, my agent never told me this. My agent never advised me about that. And they're going to create a argument that you fail to disclose. You fail to protect them. You fail to negotiate something for them. And you're in deep doo-doo when you don't advise your clients in writing to protect yourself that you did. Because you honestly did. I know you guys did. But where is your evidence? Because I don't like verbal evidence because that's he says, she said. And the sway of a jury or a judge can go either way. And your evidence needs, is, needs to prove that you did it. 
that's what, all I want you to do is have what's called bulletproof documentation. So many times our clients will decline these inspections, investigations, reports, check with the city for permits and mold inspections. So I, all I want to do is just note it, get the form acting against the advice of the broker, and you couple that with the buyer inspection elections form, BIE, and you are so bulletproof when you do those two things, okay? So that's something to talk about. It's a weapon in our arsenal for liability reduction. And I always recommend it anytime there's a discrepancy in the records, anytime you have a, a declined investigation, okay? So if they follow my guidance, awesome. Then they listen to you. Then they have a rep report on their hands and you get a copy of this. So therefore, you're not going to be uh, at fault when they complain. They already investigated this. They were disclosed to check the mold. And if there is mold later on, at least there's something that they have a report on. Okay. So I use this form when. When they fail when for sellers, there are times a seller can act against a broker advice. Like, hey, seller, you agreed to do request for repairs number one, two, three, and five. But I see that you only did one and two. What about three and five? And the seller says, I, let's see if they find it. I don't want to do that repair. I, I found, I got a bid. It was too expensive. I'm not going to do it. Guess what? Then you advise them that they, their failure to make those repairs could subject them to liability. Uh, maybe they have a city. Have on, your, on your screen, the form still rent cap under just the cost addendum. Okay. Thank you for talking because I don't know. I will stop the share and show you my screen. <laughs> uh, so we, we think it is without yeah. form. This is acting against the advice of the broker. You see it now, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right now, right. So this form is always used whenever you want to advise a buyer or seller. And sometimes a seller will have a city inspection from El Monte. And uh, maybe they're failing to make certain corrections, uh, something simple like a smoke detector or a water heater dual strapped or whatever it is. And, you know, they fail to make those repairs and they say, well, let's just see if they find it next, next time or they try to cover it up or they do a Mickey Mouse type of job. Ultimately, you need to get the documentation that you advise them that they need to follow the contract. Um, Kevin, where we can see this, this, this form? Where we can find this form? It is under the CAR library. It's called Sample Letters. ABA. They call it Acting ABA. Against Broker Advice. Oh, okay. ABA. Okay. Acting Against Broker Advice. Yeah, additional. Okay. And wow. sometimes they... I, like, like as brokerage, we never want the buyer to move into the property prior to escrow closing. Yes or no? Obviously, they could live in there. They could be liability. They could trip and fall when they move. Or they could discover a lot more defects in there prior to closing and then cause a hot mess. So some set sellers are willing to allow them to move in before close of escrow. And if they allow it because maybe they're getting a great offer, or maybe the tenant's going to pay them additional money, then I want to get this form signed. Or sometimes the buyer says, can I make some repairs before I move in? That way I can move in faster. Please, please, please. Can I uh, work on, uh, I'll pay for the uh, kitchen remodel or a bathroom model and uh, stuff like that. And we never want this to happen because opening up walls or doing any renovations could reveal more surprises or someone could get injured in liability. So we never want to allow it. Can it be accomplished? Anything pretty much could be accomplished if there's a written agreement. So yes, there's a willing seller and a willing buyer, but we want to give them the advice that it's not against our recommendation. For buyers, they could not follow our advice like Making an offer with no contingencies, or I waive my loan contingency, or I waive, I, I'm so confident I'm going to get my loan. 
I don't need a contingency. I'll get my loan. I mean, some buyers are so stubborn or believe that they're 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 bulletproof. They're willing to buy a property without a physical inspection. I don't need to see the property. I'm getting such a great deal on the price. Yeah, it happens. Investors don't need to see the property. They know what the value is and they know what the rental is going to be. So they'll just say, I'll buy the property, no contingency, I'll pay cash, I'll close in 10 days. Okay. In that situation, we would tell them, we advise you to write and have a contingency. That's simply all I'm saying. We advise you to do an inspection. Okay. Sometimes the buyer is going to be in a situation where the lender has a 21 day loan contingency. The seller asks to notice to perform or remove that contingency ASAP in two days. And our buyer says, I want the property. I want a discount. I want the repairs that they said that they're going to do. I want to move forward but my lender is not giving me loan approval. What do I do? And we say, we always advise, don't remove your contingency without your loan in place. Because what if you remove your contingency and your loan doesn't get funded in time? Guess what? The seller has a right to cancel the contract with a demand to close escrow or notice to perform. And your deposit is at risk. So we don't recommend it. Can you do it? Absolutely. We don't recommend it though, because I can't control what the seller will do or not do. And sometimes they fail to investigate the property or fail to investigate the recommendations on the general home inspection. Remember the general is just a, a overview of the foundation roof and they look for evidence, but they always recommend to seek a, a plumber, roofer, electrician, a sewer scope, termite investigation. They always recommended it for their protection to get more information. Sometimes they will close escrow or they're willing to close without a specific report or disclosure. And that's if your buyer wants to move forward or they don't care about that specific disclosure, that's okay if they sign the acting against broker advice that we advise them not to close unless we get that report, which they said they're going to give us. Um, another one is making multiple offers when they're only going to follow through on one of them. We don't use it too much because normally they, you know, our offers are only really three days expiration. So normally you would just withdraw your offer. Very rarely do you get two accepted offers at the same time, but it's to be used in that situation. As long as with any escalation clauses, promising to pay more than any other offer received. That's a situation where I write a counter offer as a buyer and I say, I will purchase your property and I'm willing to pay $5,000 above any other offer that you received. That's my counter offer. I've had many successful agents complete this. It's an escalation clause, but you're writing a blank check when you do that. So I don't advise it. Okay. Any questions on that? Kevin, you don't advise that because right now the competition is too serious. Too okay, I will advise it if it's allowable up to a cap. I don't like five thousand dollars above any other better, best, and you know prevailing offer the seller can show us. I would put up to a maximum of seven hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Okay. So I would, put, I need to put a cap on there. Otherwise, I would say this is unadvisable because they can just produce a fake offer for seven hundred and fifty thousand, and you got to pay seven fifty five. And I don't know what what who, who will make the fake offer. Some unethical people? agents. Oh really? My goodness. <laughs> and it's right now. Don't 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 expect hundred percent out of hundred percent of agents to be ethical. That that would be a fail or, or, or fool on you. Not everyone is ethical. Okay. There are some agents selling their own property and they can oh. have a friend in their own company write an offer just so that they can push up the price and show you something. Wow. Oh. Okay. Cannot believe that. <laughs> so We don't believe it. I've, I've, I've heard horse. I've heard of cases already, not in my own company, but I've heard of cases already 
from other brokers, managers saying they wrote this type of escalation clause. They put no cap on it. And it turns out, number one, you're going to have an appraisal issue. Okay. Yeah. First of all, if you're paying 5000 above anything that anyone writes on an offer, appraisers don't like that. Okay. Appraisers are going to value it based on their own findings. And what they see, they're probably not going to want to put and give a full loan on the on whatever the market's saying. They're gonna they're gonna put some conservativeness in their in their appraisal. Secondly, uh, a blank check, like like I said, you you need to you need to have a consultation with your client. That yes, you love the property, but do you even have the means to pay seven hundred thousand for this six hundred thousand dollar home? Your loan is only approved up to six hundred and six fifty. Is what we talked to the lender. What is your solution if it goes to seven hundred? What are you, you? Do you have a gift funds from a relative? Do you have an extra money that you didn't tell the lender? Do you have reserves to overcome an appraisal issue? And that's a situation where I, you know, the buyers, you know, just put so much trust on their lender, or they have so much trust in their own. Uh, I have 800 FICO scores. I'm a slam dunk client. Oh, I, I should qualify for any loan. But guess what? Lenders right now need to do full docs, especially on higher end homes. They need, sometimes these people who are well qualified have multiple businesses and therefore uh, they have a complicated financials that they have to review the business financials. They have to see if they're the owner or operator. Are they paying themselves their own salary? Are they, do they have any other investments or uh, alimony or a lot of people who have to pay child support or they have a very expensive car that they're leasing or they have student debt that they didn't think is going to count against their LTV ratios. Okay. So because just because they have great FICOs does not mean they're a guaranteed loan. Okay. So that's what I wanted to discuss regarding this training. Um, there's not too much else. Uh, there's, there's, there's something to talk about regarding uh I wanted to invite you to some of those meetings next week. Uh, the, lo the one I love the most is the Legal Protection Forum and the Realtor Risk Management Forum. You can go ahead and register for these classes, which talks about keeping yourself out of liability and best practices for realtors. I am a member of these committees, so I'm going to be joining them myself because I have to report to the Arcadia Association of Realtors on these stuff. And ultimately, yeah, your membership is paying for this. So you have the right to just take a look and listen. Any questions Kevin, before we end today's training? Yes, uh, uh, this this one earlier, the last page, last uh, paper you you disclosed, where we can find that? It's on, on the your... CAR website, there are what's called director meetings. And oh. even regular mm -hmm. uh, non-directors like yourself have the rights to listen in, but you cannot speak in any meeting. Uh, mm -hmm. Only only directors can speak and ask and ask questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll probably forward this me email out to you guys later on, to so you guys can get the quick update and, yes. and register for those classes. Great, thank you. Thank you. Oh, too much information, Kelvin. We all almost fake out. <laughs> yeah. I, I honestly, in your situation, Jean, I don't want you to, to be acting as a property manager and advising them. Yeah, no, no worries. No, just no, no. Right now is the one I I I I I have a listing in Temecula. So I need to make sure what we can do, what we need to do, you know, to, to do the right thing. So instead of after, yeah, after that have some other problems. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I would just point them to the city uh, website for sure, like Los Angeles. That one, have them mm -hmm. read their own rental housing ordinances. That when they purchase the property, they were given uh, advice that hey, city of LA has rent control in place. I mean, they should they should know this already. But yeah, that's why we need to know this information to show it to them. Yeah. So, and can those we, ordinances have, have been revised over you? the years. Yeah, after that, can I have a minute with you? Okay. 
Yeah. All right. Any other questions I can help before I end the training? 